Where have you been? Where have you been? All right, that's probably the question you're throwing our way. We have been a little MIA here for the last while, so I have to apologize. We come out, we drop these awesome podcasts on you, and then we just vanish. So that is my fault. Let me first off give you a little bit of advice. You got a computer, you got a hard drive, you got a phone, whatever, with some important stuff on there. You probably want to back that thing up, which I did not do. So my computer died on me decided it wasn't working anymore, and now my hard drive is off somewhere in Colorado with some fine folks who are getting the data off that and sending it back to me. So that's a really good time. Learn from my mistake. Don't make that mistake. Back your stuff up. Here we go. Alrighty, we're back. So this is going to be episode 11 of the Gorilla Social Work Podcast. We've been getting some awesome feedback, some awesome comments, some emails. So nice to see that people are checking it out, listening in, and have some feedback for us. So keep that rolling in. Uh, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Alpha Counseling and Treatment. Alpha Counseling is the largest and most respected provider for justice-involved clients in need of sexual offense-specific treatment services. Alpha is also a JRI-certified agency providing moral recognition therapy and substance use disorder treatment to justice-involved clients. You can be confident that the treatment you receive with Alpha will help keep you out of the criminal justice system. Alpha clinical professionals are trained and certified in cognitive behavioral interventions for sexual offending. This evidence-based program teaches participants strategies for avoiding sexual offending and related behaviors. The program places heavy, excuse me, heavy emphasis on skill-building activities to assist with cognitive, social, emotional, and coping skills development. For more information, check out their website today at Utah's. Man, I cannot talk. Utah's. Utah's best therapy. Dot com or call them directly at 801-645-5455. Also brought to you by Triple S. Triple S provides scientific outcome measures for clinicians in the field of behavioral health. Outcome measures provide direction for both clients and treatment providers using evidence-based practice. Any program not using outcome measures to track their client's progress and success has been scientifically proven to be less effective. All right, lastly, I have a question for you. Are you the type that when you go to the gym, you just want to be left alone, you just want to do your thing, but there's always some chatterbox or group of chatterboxes that don't quite get the subtle hint that, hey, these little earbuds in my ear, not only do I like music, I also like being left alone. I just want to work out. I don't want to hear your nonsense. So move away. Let me do my thing. Well, I'm the same way, and that is where Hottyware comes in. Hottyware is a new sponsor for the Gorilla Social Work Podcast, but Hottyware specializes in active wear for people who just want to work out without the small talk and the nonsense. Their idea is let your apparel do the talking for you. So they already hooked me up with a shirt that I've been wearing at the gym, which I love. Very aggressive, sarcastic statement on the front of it that just says, leave me alone. My favorite so far, the one that they gave me which says, run more than your mouth. And then I got to pick up their other one. The best thing about music is it keeps people from talking to me at the gym. So now those that don't get the hint through the headphones can check it out on your shirt, which just says, back off, dude. Leave me alone. Hottie wear. So check them out. Follow them on Instagram. They got their page up and running. And that is H-A-U-G-H-T-Y wear. Hottie wear. All right, folks. So this episode, we are going to have our good friend, Brett Bartriff, who... Used to work for Alpha, decided he was he was too cool for school, and he moved on to Davis Behavioral Health, where he works in addictions over there. So we're going to have him on the episode today. Really good discussion, and we will get into that now. Mr. Brett Bartruff. Hey. Is that how you say it? Bartruff? Bartruff? Yeah. Does anybody ever say it wrong? Yeah, don't fucking call me Bartruff. 
Bar- rough it's bar truff. <laughs> didn't someone in school wasn't so, didn't someone in school keep calling you that? Oh, probably. <laughs> like all through that growing up, familiar. that's how people nope. pronounce my name. Or I was just called Bart. That was my first name because my first name is Brett. Well, so that's all right. The alliteration. They were never like Bart. Brett Barf Truck. <laughs> <laughs> you, I know you heard that one growing up. Well, if you no, didn't, you me. heard it now. Only you never got Barf Truck? No. Oh. I coined the phrase. <laughs> barf <laughs> Truck? Barf <laughs> Truck. Yeah. Dude, that'd be so odd. Uh, hey, Barf Truck. Boom. Just sock him right in the stomach. Yeah, how, did, <laughs> how did kids not come up with that, actually? Right. Yeah. Idiots. Dude, What's, I'm where'd way, you go to school at? Way better kid. Elementary? Elementary school? Far west. Dude, they were far dropping west the ball, jokes, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, dude. They had horrible bullies. Mm, too far west to think of that. <laughs> too close to the lake. <laughs> they, they don't even know how to spell far. It's F A R. Yeah. They're all well because it's extra far. <laughs> far. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, enough screwing around shenanigans. Well, we're glad to have you, man. You excited yeah, to be here? I'm excited. Yeah. yeah. When are you going to come back and work with us again? Uh, <laughs> Beat me to the punch. Ed. Going Never. right into no, it. I'm just kidding. No, I'll think about it. Well, I keep saying I'm going to do something like this when my schedule comes down, and then yeah, that doesn't. Well, happen. we all know that. Yeah. yeah, you just you just gotta see. This is you feel like a to me. You always felt like a really balanced dude. Like you had you know you had your shit together. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Because I'm not a balanced dude. Like I'm just like if the idea is just sleep less. Yeah. Because it's just an absolute waste of time. <laughs> that is not right? me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. It, which a lot of times I envy that because, oh, no, no, you know, we'll just cut another hour of sleep out. That's fine. Right. Oh, yeah. So that's why I was like, yeah, we need to be able to get this guy back into to the realm of, of what we do a little yeah. bit. You were really good with clients. Clients loved you. I, I loved working here. I love the clients. Yeah. 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 I was telling Justin, I thought we were talking about when I came to work here, I barely graduated, like just barely. I thought I had had a little while being a therapist. No, I probably told you that. Like barely interview. graduated, like you you did almost didn't make it? No. no. <laughs> oh, no. you had just barely. I had done. just graduated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, that was good, though. You got thrown to the wolves. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so good, though. Like if you're if you're a new up and coming therapist. I, I think if you get um, if you get exposed to this population, like the so criminal justice population, period. Right. But then going into like sex offenders, right. holy shit, man! Like you're, the exposure there is just unsurpassed. Like you get a level of experience in your first year that you'll never. I mean, you don't have to stick with it. I'm just saying, what an exposure to. Well, a, you you can handle anything, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, because uh, I mean, like. Sex offense isn't like a diagnostic criteria necessarily. Well, I mean, I guess it kind of is, but I mean, I mean, like we have like a full range of different all walks of life, all different problems, anything that you could like, uh, all kinds of different curveballs walking through the door. Then we have like AP and P to report to it. There, there's so many moving parts, and it's so high stakes that anything after this is, I don't know. I, well, I guess it's just not as stressful, maybe. Well, then again, I don't know. I, I. What what is it you left us for, man? Doing this after hours phone sex yeah. chat line or something. <laughs> like, what yeah, is it? it was a call in line for nine hundred. No, I did a. I left to do crisis work. Same Z's. Yeah, I, it was it was pretty close. Yeah, yeah. I get calls in the middle of the night waking me up like <laughs> can't sleep. What's going on? I, mean, I, can't, I can't sleep, sleep either. either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what's they're definitely going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, really really want to I need somebody to talk to. I can't sleep. It was great. <laughs> I can't sleep yeah. either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, crisis work was good. Very different experience, but because I am, I very much value my sleep. Getting woke up at three a.m. I was not for me. Mm-hmm. Oh. And just finally, in a point, like I only work. Well, I have a full time job. And then I work a little part time, like our after hours clinic with with uh, private insurance clients. Just two different clients a week. Yeah. Yeah. When you when you were doing that, the after hours crisis work. I mean, you so a three a.m. I mean, what what's the percentage of like legit crises versus bullshit? What did you, <laughs> what did you notice? Oh, uh, at three a.m. I probably the whole. I don't know, how long did I do that? Not even a year. Uh, one or two, like in the middle of the night, that someone was like really struggling mm-hmm. um, and really like could use some therapy advice. Um, but overall, it was mostly just bull crap. In the yeah, of the like what? Like what are people? Co- I mean, t- to me, when I think crisis work, I'm thinking dude's got a gun in his mouth. No, man. no. But what like, is it, man? Um, uh, 
since I work for the uh, the county Medicaid provider, it's most a lot of our clients that have Medicaid that that utilize those services. Um, the call in on a crisis and towards before I would say like seven to 9 PM was like really busy. And I would go admit people to our crisis center. So I'd be at home and get a call and somebody's unstable and needs some support, possibly feeling suicidal. And so I'd go admit them to our crisis unit. But after that, it was almost always like trying to think like people were intoxicated and called the crisis line um, or like struggling having, with anxiety like high on shrooms and they're just having a bad trip <laughs> yeah i'm, I'm stuck here <laughs> trying to fix this air conditioner end. and it's not working yeah <laughs> or actually like a, um one lady that was would be super intoxicated like super drunk and call and just be like super emotional drunk and want to talk and chat it up and about the fourth time that she called i really realized she was actually a weber county resident so not even the not, not even the oh, she county dead. i worked in and <laughs> i was, was like dead to you then oh, i was like okay so you need to call here's this other number this other crisis line that so you need to utilize and she's like they don't want to talk to me <laughs> <laughs> you know oh, you're a weber county resident you scum yeah. <laughs> i'll never dude it, it is kind of weird i i was at my other gig i was doing crisis and and you'd get the most random like you said i'd get a couple that were legit, yeah. and and those were actually kind of fulfilling because yeah. you're helping somebody that was in. I mean, it's kind of fascinating that um, a lot of people say kind of a nonsensical statement. They say, you know, if somebody is going to commit suicide, they're going to do it, mm-hmm. and you know, the, it's one of those myths about right. suicide, right? right? The fact that a crisis line exists and that you're coming down to that moment, and and not admitting that. Even if you look at that yourself, you'd say, okay, I get down to that moment, I'm about to do something, and then I have kind of a little piece of intervention, and I need right. a, a lifeline one right. way or another, and then I reach out, and there's somebody there to help me. Like, that, that's pretty empowering, that's pretty, like, uh, reinforcing for me, but, like, when I had, I had a dad call me one time, and he's like, you know, he it was typical like just older guy who didn't know what he was talking about he's like i i found a cl2 cartridge in my son's bedroom can you use that to smoke pot and i'm like how is i was like what i was like he's like is it sealed and he's like yeah it's sealed you, you think it still has a pot in there i'm like no he probably has an airsoft gun bro <laughs> like, like, I, was like, I don't think you get high on co2 i mean you google it i mean i could but you probably can too i mean <laughs> Did he have that awful accent too? Well, that's just my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> for you talk any, like this for any old. It kind of makes sense with the story, though. It's kind of what I figured he would sound like. Got one of them marijuana devices, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> he, he, you stupid or what? <laughs> he, uh, he, and, and I guess, I guess my memory serves correctly. I don't really know because now that's what uh, that. And you have a picture of what that dude looks like yeah. now that you've heard that accent. Oh, like I you know, oh, yeah. you know exactly what that guy looks like i see him yeah see i couldn't just done he was like, on king of the hill yeah. I, yeah. no you you and i dressed like him for halloween once oh yeah, yeah. that was a really inappropriate yeah. costume yeah it was bad yeah it was bad dude. <laughs> not good yeah there were some guys i think that just wanted to fight us like yeah. <laughs> no that's really offensive but so you're the uh so let me get this right you're the programs supervisor for recovery support services and substance use general outpatient treatment for davis behavioral health yeah. Was in that other a, words, is that an acronym? Yeah, the yeah. P-S-R-S-S-S-U-G-O-T-D-B-H. Have that all on my card. It. Yeah. <laughs> just, oh, just it's like the LCSW not. have that shit. It's like, whoa. Yeah, that guy's big deal. <laughs> so, <this is> cured cancer. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell, tell us about your program, man. I'm, I'm interested to hear what this is about because – like, I mean, cause you, you didn't, you weren't doing crisis. You obviously went from crisis to this then. Yeah. Well, I had started, so I started the, re- the recovery support program, um, about two years ago and supervised that program and then took over supervising the out, the general outpatient substance use treatment program. Okay. Um, so we started recovery support to, we really wanted to address recidivism and, um, clients that, that finish treatment and then end up reengaging in treatment, coming back after a relapse. Uh, or drop out of treatment unsuccessfully. Yeah, can you talk about that word recidivism so people understand what that means? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so recidivism means that somebody's completed but ends up having another offense or another drug charge or or use again, another relapse, and need to come back into treatment. So I think that so that defining recidivism would mean actually a different charge, an additional charge. Definitely a, a a criminal component to it. Yeah, like relapses is. is 
not necessarily, I, I guess, uh, for, so for substance use, um, the idea of a relapse or even, um, well, I guess if a violation and sends you back to prison or something like that, that's going to be deemed to be recidivism because it's a new charge in terms of the violation. But right. we're talking about anybody who's listening to this. If, if you think, cause a client relapses, you know, maybe, you know, somebody or you have a loved one or something like that. Um, you know, they, there's some of these cliched statements out there, relapse is part of a recovery and all those things. The, the general idea there is, uh, you know, clients, there's a, a pretty high likelihood anybody coming into an, a general outpatient program that mm-hmm. needs to walk through those doors is, is struggling pretty significantly. Right. Relapse is likely. Mm-hmm. It's probably going to happen. I mean, we don't, I wouldn't want it. I mean, if you can go through your recovery without it, please do. But right. I'm just saying it's kind of the norm, not the exception. Yeah. Well, well you were talking about the difference between relapse and recidivism where you mm-hmm. like, I, I don't know if, I just want to make sure because I'm not sure I even fully knew the difference, but you're saying that recidivism is there has to be like a criminal component to the relapse. A relapse in and of itself, though, isn't necessarily criminal. Yeah. Recidivism is a is a it's a criminal justice term. So we're talking about are are you um, are you continuing to engage in behavior that keeps you involved in the criminal justice system and or creates new charges? So if I violate the terms of my probation or my parole. Um, and I'm now taken to a higher level of care to protect the community or whatever the reason is, well, that's recidivism. Now, okay. now you haven't necessarily committed a new crime. Certainly a new crime would be I, I'm recidivating, right? Yeah. Or if I've formally completed a program and then I do that again, that's certainly recidivism. But a, but a probation violation would still be recidivism because it's still keeping them involved in the criminal justice system. Correct. We and and a relapse relapses. So and I I actually really like the term relapse because it's I mean that's a medical term that was developed a long time ago to describe like diabetes or something, right? Correct. I mean any number of any number of uh, uh, medical you know abnormalities or whatever. I mean if I if I for example I, I always use the um, uh, you know some sort of heart disease, right? If I have heart disease or something like that and. Uh, my blood pressure spikes, I have angina or something like that, and I'm controlling that through diet, through medication, through exercise, so on and so forth. And then I have a relapse, and then I have you know what could be called angina going back to chest pains, thinking I'm having a heart attack, certainly elevated blood pressure, maybe I pass out. That's a relapse. <laughs> they wouldn't say your heart recidivated. Yeah, right. yeah, no, 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 no. We're, we're just <laughs> returning to something medically that we're trying to avoid, in other words, is gotcha. what we're trying to say there. So I like that concept. When I... <clears throat> I think about substance use as a chronic condition, similar to diabetes. So we find in, in traditional treatment with substance use, we provide really good, really good services for a while, right? Like we, we're really good at treating acute symptoms and acute, uh, acute problems, get people into an inpatient program or intensive outpatient, and then, you know, a year of, of uh, general outpatient. And then we let them go like, oh, it worked. You're doing well now when we let you go. So really recovery support was tr- the goal was to keep clients engaged in a lifestyle of recovery and engaged at some level of, of recovery and treatment that works for them ongoing um, to address issues as they came up. So people didn't come back and need to go back into a higher level of care that they could have those things addressed, like with recovery support services or just going back into a general outpatient setting. Man, talk, when you say lifestyle of recovery, I mean, I, I think the the four of us sitting at the table know what you mean, but like, ex, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, really recovery can mean a lot of different things to, to different people, but what the work we try to do with clients is, is to find something that's meaningful to them that keeps them, um, wanting to stay in what they've defined as recovery. Um, so many people traditionally always thought of substance use that are people that had drugs or alcohol problem that they had to not use anything, right? Like, like complete abstinence. And we know today that abstinence is different for everybody. And, 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 and some people, um, you know, continue to use alcohol, but, but have our abstinence from their drug of choice, um, or the substance that they had a problem yeah. with and maintain that as their recovery. But depending upon what they're dealing with in their substance use severity, they may need to, to choose a lifestyle of abstinence. Do you, do you subscribe at all to the harm reduction model? How do you, how do you see all that? Yeah. So, um, I'll tell you, I'm a, uh, I'm a person who identifies as a person in long-term recovery and, 
uh, it was a very go up through probably till I graduated and started working with people with, with substance use issues. I did not prescribe to, to anything related to harm reduction. I thought it was, uh, it didn't work that, that, um, people were just trying to take the easy way out or that they really didn't make meaningful changes into their life. And today, I don't think that there's a difference between living a lifestyle of recovery and harm reduction. Like I think, I think substance use treatment, that's really what uh, we ended up, we end up doing. And when we don't address what, that, we're almost negligent. What, which part? You almost end up doing what? We almost always end up addressing harm reduction. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like um, I, when I'm working with a client that I, and we're working towards termination, um, I always address with them whether drinking is going to be a part of their a part of their life um, and what issues they need to be aware of then um, people that first come in and, and are really dealing having a hard time with with their substance use you know what what sort of things can they do to reduce their risk of of problems that's pretty controversial right yeah the I mean <clears throat> my my knowledge of harm reduction, isn't all that great. I mean, I know about like Suboxone and Methadone and sometimes like a, some cities have a needle exchange, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but I, I, when I heard you talking about it, you were, you were saying something like a, an example of harm reduction might be somebody that maybe they're getting clean off this thing, but they're still choosing to drink. And that, that, that makes a lot of people in the substance abuse field cringe. It's like, ah, oh, God, right. what, no, you can't drink. But it, you're saying that like what, based on, Based on the client, there's some people that can pull that off. Right. And the the bottom line that I look at is is when it comes to a client and reducing risk and 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 the likelihood that that they could they could ultimately die or or become incarcerated or have some drastic um outcome that they're they could run into. So if if um a client is is an IV user of heroin um, and they have no court compelled reason. They have um, nothing telling them they have to stop using. Uh, it'd be really difficult for them to just whole turkey quit, quit using. Uh, the traditional substance use model is, is abstinence and many people cringe at that. But the research does show that, that things like medication assisted therapies are proven to be effective now and that they have better success rates at retention and treatment and client outcomes after finishing treatment than traditional um, treatment as usual. So it doesn't have to be two different warring tries, which one is right. 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 And if you take a a person centered standpoint, like what is in the best interest of this client is reducing their risk. uh, Then it makes sense to me. Like it's not about what I want the client to do and what I think they should do and I, what I say recovery is, but what is in the best interest of this client, then then it makes it's easier to wrap. Yeah, what will actually help them? What would they be likely to follow through on? Right. Yeah. So like if if we're basing it off what a client would be likely to follow through on, like to, to, to what – so to what degree do you tell the client they're full of shit versus, oh, yeah, we'll roll with that harm reduction? Like, it, you know, like let's say maybe you've got somebody that is, a, you know, uses heroin intravenously. Mm-hmm. And he says, all right, so that's probably the most dangerous way to use heroin. Um, I, I can't just up and quit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to smoking it. Mm-hmm. I mean, like if a client came at you like that. Like how, what, where do you go from there? Uh, I think I would start there and help the, uh, help the client identify to the best of their ability, like their desired outcomes. Like what are you ultimately hoping to achieve? Like generally it's usually not about just quitting to use a substance. It's like, I want to have a better life. Right. Like, uh, like, uh, usually that's what compels them to come into treatment. It's not just, it's not that they're using every day. If they were using every day and their life was great and they were a millionaire and super successful, they'd probably keep doing it. But what do you want to get better at? What do you want to do better? And how, how does using heroin daily prevent that with IV drug use? You know, there's a likelihood that you, uh, could die, could overdose. There's all these other health risks that you could run into. So if we're trying to cut back to smoking it, then, then, Let's let's roll with that. And what 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 else? How can we achieve? How can we get towards your goal even closer? What else do we need to address? Well, and they, it seems like there's a huge misconception about 
medication assisted treatment. A lot of healthcare professionals, doctors, and certainly criminal justice, uh, you know, probation, parole, judges, and whatnot, the way that they, I think they're very hesitant to roll with this. Um, in fact, the only ones that I've seen very supportive of this is, is one, uh, you know, uh, Vivitrol, you know, mm-hmm. is one of the ones that are more popular because it's non-habit forming. Explain what that is. So Vivitrol is a, uh, um, I mean, I could, I could give you a, a pretty just keeps you in-depth right? explanation. No, 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 so no. It's that's a, that's mm-hmm. it's a blocker of yeah. the opiate receptor. Yeah. In other wo- in, in other words, I'm gonna I'll give you some. A good, are, are Vivitrol and Naloxone different things? Your, you, so yes, but your. Oh. <laughs> let me let me uh hold on a second there. Hold on. All right, while you're while you're looking that up, yeah, let me pull it up for you. Like, but what you're saying about helping these dudes build a better life and as far as like desired outcome parallels exactly what we do with the guys in the sex offender program. Right. You know, a lot of them are coming in. Maybe their old standby fallback coping was to log on to the internet and look up pornography for. I don't know. Did you still log on to the internet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to always. Yeah. Got to sign but, in AOL. Yeah, you got to sign in. <laughs> dial up. Screen name. But yeah, like if you, if you're. If your comfort zone is to look at pornography and masturbate for hours a day, like some of our dudes will, will do that, like giving that up right off the bat is really tough because right. it's been a, such a substantial part of their life. But, uh, you know, rather than saying, don't do this because you're in legal trouble, you know, it's it's uh, maybe helping them develop things that they want to do in their spare time besides just masturbate, you know? Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So I apologize. I got it. So there's there's three main categories. So you have buprenorphine, naloxone, which is what you were talking about, naloxone. So uh, and that's kind of the generic form of what we call the suboxone. OK. And so this is used for detoxification, maintenance of abstinence of individuals over the age of, of 16. Um, methadone, which is actually old, older, I mean, it came, it was, I think it was around in the sixties. Um, also for an opiate use disorder and treatment of opioid, o- opioid addiction, detoxification, so on and so forth. Um, but they do have to be, the difference is, you know, Suboxone can be prescribed by any type of physician that is able to go through a certain level of training and then is approved. And usually they, in a certain County, they only give a number of doctors who are allowed to do this. You kind of have to do that and then go through there. Methadone it has to go through a clinic, so if, you know you couldn't go to your doc and get the boxing. You'd have to go to a clinic, which is relevant. I could go to a doc and get some boxing, but I couldn't go to my doc and get methadone. Correct. Right. Okay. And then naltrexone. So if you think about it like this, you have um, naltrexone, which comes in the tablet form, or there's there's the extended release thing is like where they're doing this with Vivitrol. Vivitrol is more effective because with naltrexone, you're going to have to take a 25 milligram, 50 milligram or 100 milligram tablet on a daily basis. Vivitrol is kind of a um, you, like if you had uh, Bupropion versus Wellbutrin, right? Wellbutrin is the, the, the name brand. Vivitrol is the name brand of this okay. product that they shoot, uh, they give you a shot in your butt and it lasts a month. Oh, okay. So I don't have to worry about it anymore. And this this is is uh, provided by prescription. It blocks opioid receptors, reduces cravings, and diminishes the rewarding effects of alcohol and opioids. In other words, if I take this, and it lasts for a month. Yeah. So if I take it, I don't Dang. even if I take um, if I take opioids, uh, heroin, whatever it is, they don't even get metabolized. In other words, I can't get high. It's a complete waste of money, and then also it curbs the cravings. So you can see why criminal justice professionals or judges or whatever would prefer that one. It's not a habit forming. I'm not actually getting high off of this. Now, here's the difference though. With methadone, which is probably the the higher category one that we look at. Again, it's not, you know, these these clinics, yeah, they're a lot of people are they're just money farms or whatever, you know, just trying to make money. I'm like, "Well, yeah, they're going to make money. Of course they are, right? I mean, that's they What's have wrong to with that? Well, right, they have yeah. to keep the the lights on or whatever. But that's highly regulated in the mm-hmm. doses. There's tons and tons of research to back up the use of methadone. Now, methadone is personally, I would that's the one I would prefer the least, just because methadone is still one of those that can be abused. In other words, I can take that to a certain level. Methadone is, you know, like heroin. The danger of heroin or opioids in, in general is I can always get higher on them. I can always get higher. There's always is where the term chasing the dragon came from. I can always get higher. Same thing with cocaine. I can always get higher. It's not like with like methamphetamine. Methamphetamine in terms of overdose rates is not even close to heroin. And the reason why is because methamphetamine, I use a ton, a ton, a ton. 
and they Amp- call it I amping remember. out, and I kind of just pass out. There's not a ton of – I mean, I'm not saying you can't overdose on methamphetamine. Of course you can. Your body just sort of hits a red line. Right. But think back in the 80s and early 90s when crack cocaine was such a big deal. Cocaine's another one of those drugs I can always get higher on. And those are those are drugs where harm reduction really has to be taken into consideration because if you don't, people are just going to start dying. And, not, and you know <laughs> – there's all kinds of a big campaign going on right now and all this money going into this. But the unfortunate piece is, I mean, millions, literally millions of people have had to die in order to right. get us to this point, which right. is crazy, right? Millions? Millions. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So you're – so – and I mean, Dang. think – put it into perspective. Think about this. Um, like if, uh, if, if you – I don't know the exact thing. I can look it up. But think about the Ebola outbreak. The outbreak, which was not really yeah, an outbreak. Yeah. I think it was like three people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was a national crisis, yeah, right? Yeah. And there's a hundred dudes, you know, a week dying from, from opi- you know, and gals dying from opioid overdoses. Like, come on now. So, like, let's, right. let's, let's take this serious and try to, um, try to like really implement some of these things and not be afraid of these medication assisted treatment. It's not an effort to keep them getting high because guess what? If I'm taking Suboxone and I'm a heroin addict, I am not getting high. It, it's almost the equivalent of if I was drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels a day, like a half gallon of Jack Daniels a day, a thing of Suboxone is like taking a shot. It just it keeps keeps me from the point of where I'm engaging in those same behaviors. And it has a ceiling effect too. It gets me to the point where, I mean, I, I, I can only get so stabilized because – I don't know your experience, but I work with somebody who's high on heroin. The times that they are withdrawing and nodding out, falling asleep, I can't have any type of productive session. Yeah. You know, they're like, go, go to treatment, Great. go to treatment. I'm like, yeah. good luck. I mean, you're not going to do anything. Right. I can talk to that person two weeks from now, maybe. Mm-hmm. Okay, that'll be a good conversation. But right then and there, and they're dealing, they're not going to be able to listen to me. Then when they're high, it's like every business as usual. So if I've reached that point, I'm no longer getting high on heroin. I'm stabilizing is all I'm doing. That's terrifying. Right. So, so this, so the suboxone is, I almost equate it to the, the analogy I like to use is, is like, uh, you know, it's kind of like NyQuil almost, you know, NyQuil doesn't really treat the symptoms of, of my it, whatever, if I have a cold, it doesn't really treat, it doesn't really help me. It, well, it does treat the symptoms, but it doesn't cure the underlying whatever it is. It treats the symptoms temporarily so my body can take care of business. I can't get sleep when I'm up coughing all night. I'm, you know, if I have a sore throat and all those things, if I take NyQuil and I can get some rest and drink some water and keep some food down, well, then now my body's going to be able to heal itself. And the same thing works with these medication assisted treatments. If I'm taking a methadone or a Suboxone or a Vivitrol, now I can do some meaningful treat clinical treatment with this person and get them to that point. Right. Yeah. So I mean, definitely a perspective that needs to be appreciated, but is really hard to get there because of a bunch of nonsense coming from people that don't know a ton about it. Well, I think that's a big part that plays a role. And like you were just talking about that, because I think a common myth that you hear with substance abuse and things like that is, just, well, they just don't have enough willpower. You know, they just don't want to quit. You know, and treatment's not effective unless they want to do it on. You know, they, unless they want to stop. Right. It's crazy to me because one thing we have learned from uh, however long of substance use treatment is that people get better from treatment and they get better even if they even if when they first get there, they don't want to. How many people got introduced to treatment because of the criminal justice system or were dragged into Mm -hmm. it that did not want to get clean but and did not want to get better, but eventually did because we know that people are more likely to, to have better outcomes the longer they have. Uh, the longer time they have with treatment. So all that's where harm reduction plays another pivotal role. Like if I can keep you engaged in treatment and, and work on reducing the risk of your use, right? Like work on reducing you from IV use to smoke or whatever, like that keeps you engaged in treatment that much longer. So maybe we're working towards getting to this point where you actually want to stop using. So basically harm reduction is sort of, it fills in the gap until you can get to the abstinence stage ideally right there's gonna be some people that probably never are fully abstinent yeah that but may they not. get to a point where i mean i know the word functional might be overused in the addiction world you know a bit but i mean that concept though right. like they can still go to work or whatever right. but maybe they'll kill a six-pack when they go home at night and that's not great but it's not a bottle of jack at least right 
And with, with opiate use, I mean, Mace is, is right on. Like, it's not a cliche that, like, if uh, somebody's using heroin to the IV use of heroin today and I can do anything to reduce the riskiness of their use, uh, they may show up to treatment tomorrow. But the likelihood that if they don't, you know, if they continue to use IV drug use, that they, they could die is it's, it's not a cliche. It happens constantly. People are legit dying. Yeah, I read it. Th- today I was reading on the news that... <laughs> That, uh, you know, we're living longer as humans because of better medical care, but the the average um, the average age uh, that people die is 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 getting lower because of opiate overdoses because people are dying at younger ages from opiate overdoses. But people that don't use and have good medical care can plan to live longer. But but our life but our overall life expectation is going it's, down. Yeah. Our expectancy, yeah. Lower yeah, because of this, because of because of the opiate epidemic. Yeah, man, I, I guess it's because. Like as compared to Ebola, like Ebola is scary sounding, you know, it's not, you know, it originated somewhere in a jungle and, you know, I've seen that movie too, right? But like it's, it's, it's outbreak. It's, yeah, exactly. I love that you know, it's, it's got that feel to it. <laughs> Cuba Gooding was good in that. Yeah, it was a solid show, but opiates are so ubiquitous, man. They're everywhere. Right. And again, if like the dude in a white lab coat's being like, yeah, take this. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. We were talking the other day, like when I was in growing up and in, in school and I, and I started using substances in, in high school, like it, we were the alternative kids, right? Like we were the outcasts, like the, the, the kids that you, you know, the bad kids or, or whatever that group of people. Now it is everybody. I'm not treating, you know, that the group of outcasts that, that use substances to, because they were having problems and didn't identify with people. Like it's, they went to their doctor and, and got on a prescription and, and had a high dose and then had a hard time getting off or everybody that they know, you know, a young group of people, everybody that they know experiments and uses opiates and, 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 a lot of time starts with prescription use. I, I think people think it's still the ne'er do wells, right? All the bad kids, the parking lot junkie types, right? It's like no, it's kind yeah, of yeah. We had burnout. Remember, yeah, it was burnout. burnout. Yeah, go hang out in burnout. Those burnout kids, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, that <laughs> well, per- the, the, yeah, the, that, that that perspective is is nuts. Like I see, I, I was pulling this up because I wanted to make sure I quoted this correctly. So it, the Ebola outbreak killed one American. <laughs> yeah, one. And everyone was losing it. Oh, yeah. The opioid heroin epidemic is killing more than 120 Americans each day. What? Each yeah. day. So Really? Right. And Congress spent billions, billions to fight uh, Ebola. And then... And what they're right. And so you Whoa. right. One twenty so, a day though. Well and, and this was saying and this was saying this was coming from um a senator, this is a New Hampshire United States senator, uh and she she was citing SAMHSA research and she's Jean Shaheen. I hopefully I'm saying that correctly. And she was asking for six hundred million dollars. So billions to fight the thing that killed one American because it was sensational and the news took advantage of that, you know, and everything. But th- this is I mean, it's it's a huge problem and, and I think the the prescription and especially the over prescription of pain relievers is and uh, you know oxycontin when it came out says it, 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 it was it was publicized as this was not one of those things that you could become addicted to but like in 2012 center for disease control this is one of another thing that she's a physician wrote 259 million prescriptions for opioid pain relievers enough for every american adult to have a bottle of pills and and <laughs> what i what i think is a problem is Party. we've gotten i don't know when we became such pussies like i mean With when, what? W- well when when did you when has ever been the prescription that you're going to live a life without pain when has that ever been a thing like you're gonna you don't die from pain no, dude. like in general people don't like discomfort I that's why they don't challenge themselves to do difficult things that's why like i i think it's kind of a component to just like oh again i'm generalizing but there's there's plenty of people that are okay trying to drift through life avoiding any types of stress or any types of struggle at any point in time and and i i think that Physical pain goes along with that. Mm-hmm. Like I'm never not in pain. My knee hurts right now. Like, like, I, like I beat the crap out of my body too. Mm-hmm. But uh, but people are averse to it. They don't want to feel it, and they think they need something to deal the the just the dullest throbbing pain. That they like, yeah, it's I don't know. Yeah, it, it's it comes a point where you can legit say suck it up and not be mean. I, I think I'd have a hard time though if I was a kid, a younger kid, dealing with something. Like you're talking about, okay, I remember when I got my wisdom teeth taken out. I think I was 17 when that happened, maybe 16. They gave me 
three months worth of lore tabs. I'm like, <laughs> what do I need? Three? I didn't take one because I don't like how opiates three make months. me feel. Three months. What do I need? Three months of like because they give me a thirty pill prescription with three wow. refills. What I mean, what for do I need? Teeth? What do I need for that for my wisdom teeth? You're but good again, in a week. And if I'm a kid, yeah. again, I'm, I'm following a prescription. My doctor gave this. I should take it. Right. No, you shouldn't. I mean, if you can deal with pain, deal with pain. You're not going to die from pain. And actually, you're you're more like you're saying. You're more equipped to deal with that level of discomfort in the future. I mean, we just need to stop yeah. being such sissies about pain. I I'm not saying people can't deal. I, I'm not saying I wish pain on anybody. I'm saying. When we got away from this idea that yeah, shit hurts, shit hurts sometimes, and and you're gonna have to deal with that. That's good. That's good that your your I, knee's painful. It's telling you to stay off of it. Right. Like, you know what I mean? I I think that doctors are getting wise to that though. Like I had, uh, you know, doing what I did, my my face sliced open a while back, and uh, when they when they stitched me up. They they gave me just like a prescription for ibuprofen, which I have at home, you know. And I was, I was surprised. I was ex, I was ex, I was like surprised that they didn't just hand over the you know the fun stuff, like oh, and like that it was kind of nice actually. It's like hey, all right, they're paying attention because yeah. I, I've gone in for way less things, and I, I've never walked out with a three month prescription. I don't know, your doctor was pretty pill happy there, mm-hmm. but like. I, I've I've had like way less severe injuries and they they they'll fill a prescription at what cost though 128 Americans a day 128 Dude, like, Americans uh, a day and what, then oh we should probably stop doing this oh, oh, okay <laughs> what, what think, are you computer having people like look up how many people die in Iraq every day I'll in look Iraq that up. war yeah, yeah Brett, I'd be curious to know I, I bet it's say? lower I think uh, your perspective Mace about you know people just need to endure pain. Like, I think as therapists, we understand that concept way better. Cause we like, we push people to go through emotional discomfort to get better. Right. Like you have to sit through this. You can't avoid it. Right. We like, we get that. But I think from the a doctor's perspective, they were like, you know, if somebody's in pain and they can take it away, oh, you know, just by taking a pill, they're going to do that. Right. And their whole thing was like, they want to want to avoid it. Uh, somebody coming back in, in to see the doctor. Like that was one thing that they tried to avoid. So that's why they would give longer prescriptions. Oh, really? well, yeah. That, and uh, <clears throat> someone comes in to see their doctor, the doctor, I would assume has this weird balance of, you know, doing my job, keeping someone safe versus customer service. Right. If, they, if they feel like I'm just saying, Oh, put some ice on it, suck it up. You know, they're going to go somewhere else. Are they going to give me bad reviews? Right. Are they going to, or you go to the hospital, their goal really when they discharge you is to have you not come back to the hospital. Yeah. They're trying to avoid you coming back in, into the hospital for something. So they would give you a longer prescription. But I have noticed a huge, a big change, especially in, in northern Utah, that, that prescribers seem to be wising up a lot. One thing that really helps, so uh, in my time being in recovery, I've only gone to the doctor once and, and thought, like, if I leave here with, with an opiate prescription, I'll be okay because I'm in so much pain. I had a really bad, like, abs abscess tooth. It was crazy. My face was all swollen. Like, and I try to just tough it out, taking ibuprofen and everything like, but I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the doctor, but I'm going to tell him that I'm a person in recovery. Right. Like I'm going to tell him. So I, that was like the first thing out of my mouth. I'm like, like mumbling. I'm a person in recovery. I've abused opiates before. I have never been offered an opiate since. Like I've had like major surgeries and they're like, you're okay. Here's some ibuprofen. Really? <laughs> yeah. I said, you'll be they made a note of it. And- yeah. It's for sure in my file. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so, so this is what I pulled. I didn't look up your thing on Iraq. I don't know. That was dumb, but <laughs> you'll I want to know. I, I bet it's worth it. It's more. How's that? Here's the thing. I was, here's what I was going to say. So, um, the, the idea of this is one of the things they're kind of, this is, uh, this is from Vox. This is a, a source from Vox and it says, you know, Americans consume more opioids than any other country standard daily opioid dose for every 1 million people. So the next close, <laughs> so if you look at this, the next closest one is Canada but we're over the 50 million mark and Canada is around 30 million or, or 30,000. So this is standard daily opiate opioid dose for every 1 million people. So 50,000 for every 1 million people in, in America and in, and in Canada, it's 30,000 for every 1 million people. And then it goes steadily down for every other country in the world. So United States is by far and away. So they talk about the cause of this. And one of the things they were saying was, so obviously, pharmaceutical companies started prescribing more effective means of of getting um, opioids into the system, and that's clear as one of these were you know, as one of these were were doing it. But then the doctors, so the doctors, to their credit, I mean, this, you can't blame this entirely on them because this does have to do with the patients too. And this is where 
I think education is important because you're right. We do understand it. But the the doctors, they were under a lot of profe- uh, like pressure from advocacy g- groups that were – some of them you know, were backed by pharmaceutical companies and government agencies to treat pain more seriously. So if I have a pain, like in my knee, for example, one of my, I, I have a great example of when I hurt my shoulder and I went into the doctor and I wanted a cortisone shot, right? And I had ripped my bicep tendon and he told me, well, what you need to do is physical therapy. I don't want to hear that because I couldn't get back to lifting weights and, you know, yeah. doing all that stuff. I wanted a cortisone shot. And he's like, look, man, if you do that, you're not going to feel any pain, but you're going to mess things up in there permanently and you don't want to do that. So he pulled apart a shoulder thing, you know, he pulled that out and told me what was going on. Because he educated me, I felt way better about that. But he spent some time with me, and he was a sports medicine doctor for Weber State University. And I was like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. We took some time there. But, and I, I just tell that because pain is complex. It's not something as simple as, you know, I'm hurting because of this and just do this and everything will get better. There, it takes time. Sometimes it might take six months to figure out what's going on. Do physical therapy and help those type of things. That's why it's called physical therapy. It takes a minute to get through mm. it. Whereas if I could just give them a pill, it's quick, it's efficient, it's billable, I don't have to worry about it, and the the patient isn't going to give me a bad review. So if I get bad reviews continually, not only as a doctor, there goes my career, because you're, you're not treating my pain. I'm in a lot of pain. Yeah, well, and a big problem that we have, what, what would it be, one of like three or four like single digits countries that are allowed to advertise pharmaceuticals, you know, drugs on TV, oh, and radio, yeah, stuff. so think right. about it, it's like, where we have this idea of, I'm going to take a magic pill, I feel kind of... I think that's a big part of the problem is people see these stupid ass ads that run just, Hey, take this. If you're having this problem, take this. So it's like we're creating the culture that does that too. So we're almost taking doctor's jobs away from them where, Hey, I I feel kind of off. I'm going to go talk to my doctor about it. And then he tells me as opposed to, Hey, I saw this commercial that said this, can you just get me that pill? And then the doctors again, torn between customer service and then doing my job. We've kind of set that up where well anything I feel kind of sad. Oh, I can take a pill. I feel yeah. yeah. Do you think it should be that? illegal? What's, what's that? Do you think it should be illegal to advertise? I don't know. I'm pretty. I don't. I don't think we should advertise pharmaceutical drugs because I think that should be the the physician's job that knows the person. Like you should feel something's off and then say I should probably go talk to my doctor and they tell me as opposed to yeah I do feel kind of down. Yeah, that commercial's right. Yeah, I need that drug and you go in and you. Tell the doctor what you want, which yeah. I think that's backwards. I don't feel like that's well. What we know about marketing is that it doesn't it doesn't teach you to be an informed consumer, right? Like yeah. you don't watch a Walmart commercial and be like, "Those are the best pair of pants; they last forever," right? You're like, "Oh, they are they're cheap. I'm going to buy them." Like marketing works just by telling people that it's available and that it works mm-hmm. or whatever. Like people are more likely to go ask that, not because it's a better product or a better pill or whatever, but because they saw it on TV and it had you know had people running on the beach. So it's got to work, right? The little cartoon butterfly. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well that's always that the I best parts of those time. commercials too. Like it, it always, so without the drug, right? When it's talking about here's the drug and, and it's like introducing it, you know, it's like, it's all dark, miserable and all this stuff. And then they take the pill and then it starts listing off the side effects and the side effects <laughs> go to a different voice for you two know, minutes. Yeah. They, you know, they yeah. have this really, energetic voice to then they go monotone and then they go into the side effects but when they're doing the side effects you're not paying attention to that because now the chick's happy she's dating she's out with her girlfriend she's doing all kinds of stuff and then and then she comes back you know and then she says so talk to your doctor today but like oh yeah that's what i'm gonna do you know that's what i'm gonna and and it is a quick fix and i think we we do like quick fixes and don't get me wrong i like the efficiency of where this stuff has gotten us but you have to be careful with that and it's very dangerous it's kind of like Every one of us have gone to the doctor recently and seen that little chart that says, you know, where's your comfort level? And you have a frowny face and a smiley face. And that thing, I had, I went to a, um, a presentation on Suboxone once, and the doctor said that alone, that chart alone, is is very respo- is, plays a key role in a lot of opiate addictions really? because a cl- a patient's going to say, I want to have a happy oh, face, yeah. and the doc, and and again, the doctor, what's the doctor going to say? No, you know what, you're do- you're just going to have to deal with some pain for a month. And uh, come back and see me, and then we'll go from there. That that patient's going to complain. They're going to write a review. Yeah, they're, they're going to go somewhere else. Right. Yeah. And that doctor is not. So I, I can't. You, I, I, we can't fault doctors a hundred percent. It's mm-hmm. not. What I do think, you do though? If if you're, I mean, because well, first off, I agree that patient responsibility is is important. But okay, how? 
You know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you get people to suck it up? Well, this is where recovery support services, I think is an important component in all this stuff. I mean, because temporarily, you know, if I go into an inpatient program or anything like that, I've always, and I don't know how you think about this. You know, I've always thought it was weird that you graduate from a program. You're graduated from this lifelong chronic disease. No, you're not. Right. I got hard. I don't graduate from heart disease. I don't graduate from cancer. I don't. I mean, <laughs> I have to go through follow up exams, and I have a support. So the recovery support system seems like, yeah, if I am down and out, I'm thinking about moving in that direction. I have people that can support me. I mean, you think about the reasons why you're able to do that. You've got a lot of stability in your life. You got people who care about you. You got people who are going to be there for you. You got people that even if you tried to start getting addicted to opiates, that people would intervene. And those guys don't have them. And the recovery support services, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, does that for them. Yeah. Yeah, offers so. that support. We uh, work with clients on an individual plan of recovery that often includes things like when you go to the doctor, how, you know, that was my, that was part of my individual plan when I went to a doctor and I may, may walk out with a prescription was to inform the doctor before I left. Um, and to inform somebody in my life that was important to me that, Hey, I have this prescription. Like I may have to take this. I want to make you aware. Um, and not everybody has right. Not everybody has those natural supports. So, uh, recovery support services offers that to people offers that assistance of, of, you can call us. We do individual recovery coaching with clients. Um, what's that? So clients will call and, and could, could, call their, their recovery support specialist and say, Hey, I'm struggling with this, or I need, how did you handle this with your recovery? Uh, everyone on the recovery support team has a lived experience of being in recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, so they kind of help them with through their own experience of how they, so they're talking to the, the clients talking to someone that's like legit been there before. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's been one of the, for me, like something super rewarding. And that's not, that's not clinicians, right? No. Well, so the recovery support team is made up of, uh, we have peer support specialists. So people that just uh, have lived experience and got certified by the state to be a peer support, um, provider. Uh, we have bachelor's level social workers, um, and we have, we have recovery support therapists. So we, there's two of us that are therapists on the team that are also people in, in recovery too, on the recovery mm-hmm. support side. Yeah. yeah. Cause I think about, I think about that, uh, you know, Okay, so like if I'm co- if I'm coaching somebody, and I'm much better equipped to deal with this if I have if I have been there and done that, right? I mean, there's a level of empathy can be, that can be offered by a peer support specialist that me as a clinical professional can never offer them. I mean, I can impart knowledge onto them, and I can I can give them expertise about things, and I think I I offer them a new way of of maybe helping them think about it differently, but. There it is right there. I mean, that's, that's about my, that's where my expertise and, um, clinical knowledge and, and assistance with doing therapy ends and that their addiction begins sometimes. And they need a person who has some direct level of empathy, but that, that I can offer. It's far superior sometimes to what we can offer them. Yeah. I think there's a level of empathy that the provider can, can offer. There's also just this automatic, like, um, there's this automatic support credential that you get as a person in recovery that, right. that a client will be like, I can identify with you. I, sometimes I think it's hilarious. Like my clients that have way different experiences with, with addiction than I ever had, but they're like, you know how it is, you know how it is. I'm like, yeah, sure. I do. Yeah. I've never had that happen. I've never used that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not been experience I've had, but they'll identify with that. I think though, as a, so as a therapist, um, is something you need to be hyper aware of, um, in a, in a like psychotherapy context, if I'm working with a client, that's my therapy client, I have keep that pretty clear that I'm not there. I'm not their recovery buddy. Like I'm their therapist and, and I'm going to point out their thinking errors and their addictive behaviors. And if they over identify with me as their recovery buddy, sometimes that gets blurry, but you draw a pretty clear distinction. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I do. And I set that, I try to set that up with clients that like, you know, um, you may identify that we've been through, through similar things. Um, but I'm not here to back you up. Well, yeah. What's the main difference then between a recovery buddy and a therapist then as far as the therapist, the therapist role, what, what boundaries does the therapist have that may be a recovery? buddy? So, uh, recovery buddy recovery support specialist they go out and do activities with them we ho- we host weekly activities that that clients 
come to um, go pick clients up and take them to their appointments, help them act, do a lot of case management things as well. Uh, but just have a different, that's their, that's the role that they play. Uh, but as a therapist, it's, it, if I'm the person that's uh, taking somebody to their doctor's appointment, hanging out and, and doing activities with them, it'd be really hard for me to point out you're having this, this pretty significant cognitive distortion. You know, I have this thinking error that's impacting your life greatly for them to, to right. be like, not want to be like, I thought you were my friend. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're being kind of a douche and I need to make you aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you that's so again, if you think about that in the context of because uh, I, I like the idea that, that we can share with clients that this is a chronic disorder. This right. is a chronic disorder. You're going to be dealing with neurobiological disorder. You're going to be dealing with for the remainder of your life. And when you start speaking that, I think clients get jazzed about that. They're like, man, you're somebody's starting to understand this. I don't think the, br- the, the gap has been bridged where clients take it that seriously either. Right. They like hearing that. Right. But if you, if, if we started treating our mental health like we did our physical health, right. man, we would be way better off because they just don't take it as seriously. They don't take, they, they think I graduated this program. I'm good. Right. You're not, you're not good. I'm not saying you're going to relapse. I'm saying you need those support systems. And yeah, as a therapist, I can only go so far. And my role is way different. My, uh, if I go to a physical therapist, they're going to hurt me. Mm-hmm. That person is going to hurt you, physically hurt you to try to get that better because they're trying to get blood flow. When I went to a physical therapist for my shoulder, it hurt. It hurt the entire time. And I said, like, what is that? It's really hot. And he's like, well, we're getting blood flow to there so it can heal. And, and I always, I always like, um, talk about that. You guys ever heard of that congenital insensitive, um, disorders like in anhedonidrosis or something you like, you can't Anhedonia? No, 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 no. It's the, the, dis, the genital, dis, the congenital disorder that you can't feel pain. Oh, um, no. And a lot of people think, oh, that's, you know, oh yeah, right. No, I'm jazz, I have I'm heard get of that. jazzed up about that. That's I'm not like, good. look, yeah. here's the thing about that folks. Like you, if you can't feel pain, you don't know how to heal. Like you're, if you were born with that, you might say, oh yeah, I get in fights and I'd win or, or I would do whatever I want and I'll get hurt. Well, what if you break your arm? Are you going to know your arm's broken? Other than functionality, yeah. you may not know, and then you might grow. That arm might heal in a really awkward way, and then you'd be deformed for the rest of your life. Yeah, pain's good. It's an adaptive trait. Yeah, but- if I don't feel pain physically and or emotionally, how am I going to know how to heal that? I'm not going to. And so, I, in other words, I mean, this idea I'm going to get rid of pain. You need to embrace that. You need to embrace that pain and embrace the fact that there are going to be periods in your life we're going to hit these lows. And you need those support services. I mean, a recovery coach, uh, it, even if they said, hey, I'm dealing with this, that, and the other, and they hooked them up with a community service that they didn't know about before, which most of us take for granted. Oh, if this happened, I would go here and take care of that. Simple, right? Anybody who's in you know, the drug underworld, none of this, they don't know any of that stuff. Right. Oh, crap. I mean, and having somebody there to help you is going to be mm-hmm. crucial. Or have you ever have you ever gone through the process of like applying for community based supports, like applying for Medicaid? It's really easy, man. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. If you take somebody that's been that all they know how to do is use substances, right? Like they just they've been using for the past year. Be like, all it's really easy. Just log on. Just you get on the computer. A, they may not have a computer. They may not have computer access, right? Like they may not. They may not know how to do all those things. To actually just go down to workforce somebody. services, bro. You can They're great. They'll yeah. just they'll, they'll do it for you. It's simple. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you just tell them what you want to do, and they'll fill it out. Oh, you're, you've got it. That's, exa- to, that's exactly how it works. Right? Yeah. And I think the most I th- another really frustrating thing for clients is there's so many like rules and regulations between but behind what who's eligible for what community supports and us being able to kind of explain that like be prepared you know this may be an option but it may not or it w- is not an option you know for somebody who goes and applies for that and then they're like get, get denied for some services that they didn't know about and they spent an entire day riding the bus down to workforce services yeah. to apply for yeah it's tough because you're trying to to the message is sometimes I think that you're taking away a lot of close connections, but, but from these individuals, because it is true. I mean, you're, you're talking about risk potential. I ask a lot of my clients, you know, identify people that could allow you to have access to drugs. Like who would those be? And what are we going to do to limit our contact with them or sever that contact altogether? And the message sometimes I think is, and, and then we're hooking these up with these other people. 
well, wait a minute, those are my bros. I've been with those guys forever. I mean, so like if I identified, if I started to to develop this in high school, those have been my buddies for a long time. You're saying don't go with them. Look, it's not, those aren't bad people. Just like you're not a bad person. You know, anybody who's dealing with this, they're not ready for their recovery at this point. They're just, their lifestyle is incompatible with what you're trying to accomplish. And that's it. They're not bad people. I'm not trying to say that. And these people aren't necessarily, you know, I'm not saying that they're good people. I'm saying they're here to help. And they do care about your recovery because they've been through it and and it's meaningful. It's been a meaningful experience. It's like that show Intervention. I hate that show. So, I mean, like, so do what we say or you're dead to me. Like, right. It's a guilty pleasure, though. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, a, I mean, like, again, it's frustrating. It is super frustrating. But a- a- after all this is said and done, I mean, the only thing you have that keeps you grounded in a lot of these things is the relationships you have in your life. I mean, if I, I try to say everything. Look, if drug use makes sense, that person's going to use. What can we do to make a lifestyle, to help that guy make a lifestyle where drug use just doesn't make sense anymore? That is what you need to get to. Not, I'll punish you, I'll take it away from you, or I'm going to take, I'm going to do whatever to punish you or threaten you or any of those things. No, 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 no. I need to help this. Get that dude a job, get him some friends, get him a safe place to live, and you're 80% of the way there. Like, I mean, <laughs> you solve a That's lot a of problems. That's a piece of it right yeah. there, yeah. I think one other thing that like perpetuates a big problem in in our society is that we do still view the person that uses as a bad person. Like, I mean, did uh, right. just the other day did the not like top attorney in the United States say that that good people don't smoke marijuana? Yeah. Yeah. I was so pissed. I was like, there are countless people I know that I work with. They're amazing well, people, and, that use and marijuana. probably him. Right, yeah. yeah, right. No, they just sexu- yeah, right. they just sexually abuse people. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. Jeez. Right, right. But uh, but we have that that stigma that it's 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 this choice that you're just making bad choices. And that it's bad yeah, people. It's the, that it's bad people. We don't ever do that with someone with diabetes. We don't offer them really good medical care. Get their blood sugar all in order, right? Like like they're they're give them insulin, they're checking their blood sugar three times a day, and then they're like, Oh, you're good. It's it's been stable. We're gonna take that all away. And then when you have high levels, you know, your blood sugar's out of whack, we're gonna say, You're a bad person. You chose bad bad. And, and it's gonna be that. harder for you to find a job because because you have diabetes, you yeah. have diabetes. Yeah. You high blood sugar. Well, well, I mean, bastard, like right? it's like dirt bag. <laughs> I mean, the metaphor might even be like calling a, the diabetic a bad person when they binge on Ben and Jerry's one night and their blood sugar spikes. You know, right. it's like you were weak. You relapsed. You gave it. Yeah, you know you, that, that you're weak. You're bad. I mean, it's it's. I mean, I don't know that I'm comparing Ben and Jerry's with heroin, uh, other than that. Maybe some of the thinking behind the use could be similar. Well, similar right. idea with like the impacts on the healthcare system, like financial costs to, to taxpayers and people paying into the healthcare oh, system. Oh yeah, you right? can easily look at it that you way. You could actually, yeah. Yeah. but we're not going to say that to people. Well, yeah. you will look at, at addiction as a brain disease. Also, it has these behavioral components, but it is a brain disease that tells you there's nothing wrong with you and compels you to use. There's we all have a drive for hunger and 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 inclined to like sweets, right? But you don't have a brain disease that's compelling you to eat Ben and Jerry's, right? Yeah. Well, it like, feels that way. It sometimes does, <laughs> right? Uh, that's the difference. But when somebody somebody uses heroin, um, we, we think that we say that they're a bad person. And even the analogy, like somebody's blood sugar is regulated with the regime that like their, their doctor says to use and they have a relapse. Like they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're taking their insulin, they're checking their blood sugars and they have out of control uh, blood sugar levels, we don't say, oh, well, that, that that treatment didn't work, right? We adjust the treatment. That's what another thing recovery support services is about. Like recovery one way may work right now, but you may have an issue come up. And that may be, uh, hopefully we get it before it's pre-use, but if you have use, like we, we adjust the treatment. That may not mean we just say, you know, it didn't work. Uh, we're going to send you all the way back to the hospital or whatever, the, Dude, the more intensive the, treatment. Yeah, you're, you're adapting to what the client presents with. Like we just recently switched up our curriculum uh, that we work with the sex offender dudes to, to that exact thing. Uh, a lot of, for that reason, I mean, this is a bit of Mace's brainchild, but I mean, uh, it, at any given time that a client's coming in, they, they'll present a behavior chain and you know, detailing something that happened in the week and how they reacted. And then as a therapist, when we say, okay, the client went, okay, this was the issue this week. Then we have like from like one from one of eight different kind of potential catch-all domains to choose from 
that might meet the problem the client brought in with their homework assignment that week. And then we teach them that concept, you know, one of the eight different domains and then send them packing with a new behavior chain and maybe a little handout for that specific thing. But the, the point is, is that we don't have this one size fits all cookie cutter approach anymore. It's okay. What's happening this week. Okay. Here's how we'll actively address that thing this week. Here's the plan of attack. Have at it. Okay. Now here's the next week. Okay. Now what, now what are we working on? You know, we're constantly right there, right where the client is awesome. at any given time. Yeah. And so it sounds like what you're doing in a way. Right. Right. I definitely felt like, you know, when I worked here, we had this, this, model that we followed, but we still did that, right? Like we addressed the uh-huh. assignment there, they're on and uh, still, but really what's going on with them. We still looked at and, and, and address, we didn't like, Oh, well, we're not dealing with that. You're not on that. That's not your assignment. Well, and the, all the assignments were like, yeah, you're working towards good things. How's that? Not well, it, it, right. it just, I think the historical stuff starts to focus on past factors. It's like, I don't know what that's doing for you right now, particularly if a dude had an offense 10 years ago. Right. To some degree, do I need to know a little bit about what happened? Absolutely. Do I need to maybe understand lifestyle factors that were present at that time to assess whether or not they're present now? Sure, of course. Beyond that, I don't know how much I need to know about that stuff. I need to know what's going on right now, right? Right. That's way more important um, and than, the, than these previous things. And that's I, I think clients need to hear that message more than anything. It's not, you shouldn't be defined by your worst decision. Yeah. And nowhere on the planet do we make anybody else do that. I just, you know, hey, my name's Mace. Let me tell you the worst thing I've ever done. Like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I mean, there was a, on the thing, uh, um, you were talking about like, you know, costs and stuff like this with heart disease and, stuff, and diabetes. I always like heart disease compared to diabetes. I don't know. I just don't like saying that word diabetes, but diabetes. diabetes. Well, here's the thing. Like, Welford Brimley, dude. Yeah. Well, cause you, cause people <laughs> say bad, bad, so it's a moral thing. Uh-huh. So you're talking about, uh, Jeff Sessions, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So Jeff Sessions sa- says bad people are the only ones who smoke weed. Well, here's the problem with this. So mm-hmm. I don't know what bad means, but what I what I take from that is you're talking about morals at this right. point. Okay, fine. So moral, that to me says, because I get pleasure from smoking weed, that makes me immoral, in other words, right? But you were referencing Ben and Jerry's. Well, if I... <laughs> Do I not get pleasure from eating Ben and Jerry's? I mean, yeah. you don't eat it because it sucks. You no. eat it because it tastes awesome. The pleasure is certainly different. I would never come. Yes, you can eat a, a, an actual ton of Ben and Jerry's and it won't c- equate to a meth shot. Okay, fine. Well, we concede that. But if you look at the cost, you're talking about costs. Like, so the the taxpayer cost to the, to the substance use problem is $511 billion annually. That's a lot, right? Well, the heart disease is $555 billion to the taxpayers. And you can make these arguments. So you could say, well, 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 now hold on now. Those people chose, those people chose to smoke those drugs and they did that. And now that's why they have an addiction. Okay. Can I choose not to exercise? Can I choose to smoke cigarettes? Can I choose to eat like shit? And get give myself heart disease? You bet. You bet. Can I choose not to take my medications? Can I choose not to, you know, get health insurance? One of the of, of course you can make those choices. Okay, well, it's not about it's not about then the choices. Um, you know, there there's the the it's it's a it's a pleasure thing. You get more pleasure from that. Well, again, I get pleasure from eating crap. I get yeah. pleasure from sitting home and doing nothing and not exercising. Exercising sucks sometimes. I get pleasure from smoking cigarettes for that matter and getting hard. So the one linchpin there is we've chosen to criminalize the substance use disorder versus heart disease. But I could make the same argument. I could say, you know what, dude, I'm sorry, Jim, but we've got to put you in jail for 12 months to save your life from that heart disease. And, and you know, that's going to be safer for you in jail and we're controlling all your behaviors than letting you eat Twinkies every single day. You haven't proven yourself to be safe in the community around Carl's Jr. Yeah. (laughs) You're costing us. So, because again, if you took the criminalization piece out of it, why then would anybody have to engage in criminal behavior to get high? Now I've eliminated it. It's still a chronic disorder that I'm dealing with and I still have to treat it differently. So the fact that we've chosen to criminalize it is the one thing is that's making it cost a ton because we have to regulate this now because all these criminal things have to happen in order for me to get these drugs. So if you decriminalized it, you're not going to see a huge increase in people doing drugs. That's not going to happen. Like that's, you might see a little bump at first, but it's not going to turn into like, you know, bedlam. Yeah. 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 It's well, 
there's been there's been it's uh, like the con- reefer madness movies yeah, yeah you, people yeah. just like run a sprint out the window just <laughs> yeah. yeah well there's been country after country after country and, and again making it completely legal versus decriminalizing it are two different things right? yeah and and i think if you decriminalize these drugs you 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 are able to now treat this appropriately as a healthcare disorder, but you can't. So this is where it becomes a problem. You can't call so call something that this is a chronic disorder and then also criminalize it. You can how, how could you do that? If you're going to do that, fine, do it to everything else. Heart disease, particularly let's start throwing those dudes in jail because why, why aren't people to willing death. to see, why aren't people willing to see what you're talking about? Cause it's so obvious know, to me. I just don't know. I'm I just, think there's a, there's a finger pointing like a privilege to that too. So someone, let's just take someone that knows that they're not exactly healthy. It's kind of makes you feel better. Like, well, I'm not doing that though, oh, but so I'm like, not doing drugs. So like not, some fat yeah. shit can point at the person that's maybe drinking a little Don't bit fat too shit, much. Bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Someone who is ultra unhealthy and which if you are, that's fine. But I'm, I'm I'm saying I think that's a portion of it, but it's like easier to point the finger sometimes. Like, well, it's not this though. It could be What that. a dumb comparison though. I mean, guys, a lot of, People in our programs do that too. Oh, I yeah. pop pills, yeah. but I never, I never slammed it. You know, I never. Oh, I sure. It. That's, That's how you can feel better about yourself. Yeah. yeah well, but, and people yeah. are constantly trying to look, man. You got to change your metrics. The only person who should matter to you is you, right? I, I try to, I try to look at my life and say, okay, what, what does success look like for me? Well, if I was comparing myself to Bill Gates, I'm going to be a failure the rest of my life. I'm going to be a total yeah. loser ass failure the rest of my life because that dude's on such a high different. That is such an erroneous argument. You're right. It's a, it, my metric on how I'm on how I'm treating myself and what I want to get out of my life needs to change and be more personalized in that regard. But yeah, well, I yeah. Well, and I think of, I tend to go back to like being a kid too. So the whole dare program thing, which is, which is stellar, super effective. But, but think yeah. of even just back then, the, the picture t-shirt. that that painted to kids, like, oh, if those other kids are over there doing that, then they're bad. You got to stay away from them. Like we were, we learned that early that is, on. It was that, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so he's bad. It always showed them. They had like a denim jacket on with a collar up and like yeah. one earring in, spiky yeah. hair. Yeah. yeah, it looked like mace. I don't want to be. I don't want. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be bad. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Is like there's so you're, it's not even that you you had problems in your life leading up to it. Just you're just a bad person and you do bad things. Yeah. Do you know yeah. how much I wrote a paper on this in college about how much money we spend on prevention? Like the DARE program is self-sufficient just from donations, like way more than self-sufficient. Yet the government still puts so much money into it yeah. and it is so not effective. There's tons of yeah, research. Worthless. But we want to believe that we can put money into preventing a problem. Like the hell with evidence-based research. Yeah, Let's matter. just. Are yeah. you saying you want to take away money from keeping kids off drugs? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How <laughs> dare you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's well, and they've. I mean, there are some evidence-based uh, prevention programs. Dare is not but one. That's of not them. one of them, <laughs> right? Dude, what and, about what about scared straight? Yeah, that works all the time. That works all the time. What about Beyond Scared Straight? Um, <laughs> what about Beyonce? <laughs> yeah, what about her? Yeah, yeah, she's what, cool. Yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, no, scared but, straight. No, perspectives though do need to change, and that's where I, I feel like because I've heard I've heard politicians say that. I've heard right. them say. Um, you know, that, that this is, this is our, our number one health, cr- dude, if you're going to call it a health crisis, stop criminalizing it. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to do one or the other. If you said, yes, this is a health crisis, but you know what? Public sentiment. If you were honest, this is what you'd say. This is a, this is a health crisis. It's been proven time and time again, medically, that this is a problem, but public sentiment is not in support of us treating this like a health crisis. So we're going to keep trying to do it the criminal justice route. See you guys, and that's well, it. You just have to, if that's you're being honest, that's really what the truth don't is. Don't say both, though. Don't, yeah, don't say this yeah. is a healthcare crisis. We need to treat it, and so we're going to funnel all this money into rehabilitation, which I appreciate. Don't stop doing that, politicians. By the way, I appreciate that you do that, but you can't also have the criminal aspect there because it complicates things from a treatment perspective. If I have a threat and, and a you know and, and there's a you know they have the threat of whatever and they have the thumb on them forever. Well, once I don't know, my hope is that in the course of treatment, the client is intuitively able to now start applying and practically applying these skills and seeing the changes for themselves and allowing their motivations to evolve over time. Whereas initially, like you're saying, they come in out of fear, they're coerced, they're compelled to be there, right? But some of them don't. Some of them are under that threat and the day that threat goes away, they go and relapse. And mm-hmm. it's a, and, and because I no longer have my motivation 
And I'm not disciplined because I didn't really practically apply this. I relied solely on this threat, which is unsustainable. It can't stay there for the long run. So trying to back off of that a little bit and having some more practical solutions is really, I mean, if you don't want people to use drugs anymore, that's the direction we need to go. I think that people feel it's like a black and white thought, like, like decriminalizing means we make everything unregulated yeah. and just open it up like that. Oh. That I hate that, that people, you know, just everybody each open do the to their gates. own. Yeah. So that libertarian, the like, yeah, everybody just do what they do. It doesn't affect me. We don't live. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. But we look at like alcohol is legal and for the most part, except in Utah, mm -hmm. less regulated than most things. Right. Mm -hmm. And alcohol is problems with alcohol is, is huge. Like how many people die from alcohol related issues mm -hmm. or drunk driving or things like that? Like, there's still, I think regulation still serves a, an important role. Yeah. Right? Don't open the floodgates. Right. Right. By any stretch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. There's that fear. So if our DUI deaths are at X level or whatever, and if we deregulate some or pull some of the restrictions back, well, then it's going to be worse. The number is going to be higher. So there's that knee jerk reaction oh, that yeah. people have. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And, and two, how other people measure. I, I sit in, and I don't know. Like, you know, a, a good measure for these folks is clean days, you know, but and clean days is great. But the one thing I always kind of have a hard time with is this idea of consecutive clean days. So you go into a oh, drug yeah. court and they'll say, OK, how many days clean do you have? Oh, 300. Everybody round of applause and everything. Right. OK, fine. Consecutive clean days. I think you look at the function of consecutive clean days. Consecutive clean days allow you to get your life in order again to make it incompatible with drug use. They're not in and of themselves the solution. It's not like I reach a number and then I'm done. Like you reach a thousand, you got it, buddy. You're right. cured. That's not how it works. So I, I kind of compare this. I say, okay, let's say you got two people, 500 clean days, right? All right, so 500 days, 500 days. Person A was was off the hook for the first 250. Half their time they were using multiple times a day, every single day for 250 days straight. But – they maintained 250 clean days by the time court rolled around. Whereas the other person from Jump Street, they had 450 clean days. And then on 451 or 452, they relapsed. And then the rest were clean. It's like that other person has way less clean days. And their their recovery process has been less substantial than the person who has 250. Because you only got 48 clean days. That other person has 250. Is that how much looked at? Uh, absolutely. <clears throat> and I say, okay. <laughs> You can't look at it like that. As as like if you put that into a pie chart, okay, what are you looking at? You're looking at half and half and a sliver of time. And the, so the I, I try to say, you know, recovery is a process. It's not an event. I don't just now I'm recovered. It's a process. And if if a person relapsed and they had a couple day stretch and they come in and say, Brett, man, I can't believe this happened. And I did this, and, and we need to talk about it. And Brett's going to be really cool about it, and he's going to – you know, what an excellent learning opportunity. Let's let's break this down. Let's not squander this. It sucks that it happened, but we're not going to let it get the best of us. We're going to learn from this. And instead, I say, nope, now your clean days are gone. we got to start all over. I will never, ever come to you again and tell you that I relapsed. Ever. Never yeah. will I come to you again if you do that to me because now you said – all those days before are irrelevant because I relapsed that day. And now my clean days are going to like, screw you, mm. man. That is exactly how it's looked at. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. It's Horrible silly. way of looking at it. I think drug courts and, and programs like that are trying really hard to get away from that's the only measure of progress. That's the only measure of, of completion is consecutive clean days. Right. Uh, because I mean, I'm sure you've, you've seen working with clients, like you can have somebody that's been clean for a whole year and they're still, their life is a disaster. Right. They're the same person as, as they walked in. Right. Or you have somebody that relapsed, like had uh, a use a drink, like two months before completing their program, but have, has worked that whole time, improved their family relationships, but their graduation could, you know, their completion could be completely mm -hmm. off or be sent back by the court to mm -hmm. a higher intensity, like start the whole thing over. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I'm not saying they're, I mean, at that point I kind of say, just, just make a machine, <clears throat> put a machine in the court where you come in and you, you put in, like, it's like one of those test scanners. Here's my UAs. <laughs> and then you print out my sanction or it prints out like a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> <That's all. laughs> yeah. If I've had no use, you know what I mean? Because again, if, if that's all it boils down to, what are we doing? What are we doing here? If, it, if it's just consecutive clean days or clean days period, and sometimes, 
you know, the way that dilutes are looked at. And I, I get that's all a problem. I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm not saying it's not a problem. I'm saying, can we use another measure, behavioral observations, what's going on in the rest of their, their lives? I mean, if you, if you take a person's kids away because they had one relapse and, and that doesn't always happen. I'm not suggesting that happens, but I'm saying it, they go to jail, they lose their job, their kids get taken away, you know, or something like that. But, oh, so did you do more to stabilize their recovery because of the sanction, you know, and, and, of what happened. And it always turns into, you know, well, you should have thought about that. Yes. I should have, I hate that. Line. You should have thought about this when you, when you sexually offended, you should have thought about this when you started using drugs. Yeah. I should have thought 20 years from now, I'd be talking to some douchebag sitting in front of me <laughs> telling me I should have thought about this. I, I should have thought that about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of course I'm not it's a thinking cop about out. that. It's a cop out for people in our field that don't want to think critically and have a good answer for a client. Mm-hmm. Should have thought about that before you did the crime. Yeah. Don't want to do the and, time. Don't do the crime. Right. And, like that type of shit. And look, here's any message for, I'm not bagging on, on other, like, I mean, there are some really good probation officers that we work with, parole officers that really understand it. And, uh, you know, case workers, anybody and judges, I think are really starting to come around. Everybody's starting to show a humility to be educated. And I think that's a, a component of this because we still have to do that too. When I, when I am listening to probation and parole, I have to be humble enough to say, I don't, look at the lens through they look at and they have a completely different job and I have to respect that and at times take a step back and say you know more than I do about this I'm going to I'm going to you know I'm going to see to you on this one you go for it and then we go from there and and I think that's a huge piece about this is just having a little bit of humility is going to go a long way that's one thing I've really had to do as a therapist um is is really collaborate with the criminal justice system with drug court with the POs because I have this very limited set of data, this 50 minutes I see a week of a client, right? And Mm -hmm. and from what they tell me, that can really skew my perspective on that client. And a PO has this much broader range of data that can include UAs and house observations, stuff that I don't see that sometimes I need to look at, oh, you know, they're seeing stuff that that I don't, you know. I think we've all probably had that where you've been snowballed by a For sure. They're doing amazing. They're awesome. They're improving all these things. And their PO's like, no, bro. Yeah. <laughs> That's not happening. Really, yeah. though. You feel hoodwinked, but you know what? Like your your willingness to say, "Yeah, I got hoodwinked, man." Yeah. I got is that now makes you way better at admit, you know, that you dropped the ball in some respects. That you made made some bad judgment calls and that you could have done better. You're going to be much more prepared for that the next time. And clients need to hear that. You know, it's saying, I'm sorry, man, I, I made the wrong decision on this one. You know, maybe it's not when they're getting in trouble. Sorry, see you in prison. Yeah. You know, like, but I mean, if I, if I made the wrong call and it had a negative impact on the client, say, I'm sorry to that person. It goes, a, a it's a, I mean, that goes a hundred miles to say, yeah, I'm no, I'm not, I, we're trying to figure this out together. We're in this together and I make mistakes too. And I'm willing to apologize when I do make those mistakes and they and they're much because it's this idea that I'm never going to apologize when I make mm-hmm. a bad call. Come on now, like you're not you. you sure. make, everybody makes mistakes. It's okay. Like right. that's why they call it a practice. You know. So how do you? So let's wrap this up, man. How do we? How people get a hold of you? Uh, you can call Davis Baby Health eight zero one seven seven three seven zero six zero. Ask to speak with Brett Bartrup. There's like <clears throat> three. Now, of what's us. your cell phone number? My cell phone number. No, three. I'm kidding. <laughs> three, you yeah. don't have to give it unless you want to. Is it a company cell it's phone? It's a company cell oh, phone. Oh, shit. You got to give it now. 385-405-4242. Okay. Brett B at dbhutah.org. Please don't send him inappropriate yeah. pictures. Oh, do please it. don't. Yeah. <laughs> this is 20, 20 dick pics <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> immediately. Oh, yeah. if I get text messages like that, I'll just forward them to you. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Look what somebody sent me. <laughs> Okay, everybody block Brett now, so <laughs> yeah. that can't happen. All right, well, we're glad to have you on, man. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate being here. I appreciate, you know, when I got to work with you guys, taught me a lot. You cool. got to come back again, man. Okay. Not just in the podcast, but you got to come do some therapy with gotta us. Come do some therapy. Come yeah. on back. Okay. I actually don't live that far from the Salt Lake, like way closer to the Salt Lake office now. Nice. Yeah. We got a way bit nicer office too now, so. Oh, you do? Maybe yeah. I don't then. Yeah, we're, we're 30, so close, 33rd though. South. You're close. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, brother. All right. That's it, folks. We'll see you. Thanks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap on episode 11 of the Gorilla Social Work Podcast. We want to thank you for tuning in. We also want to thank our guest, Mr. Brett Bartriff, for coming on the show. It's good to see him again and talk with him. 
Next episode, we are going to have Jen Wojcikowski come on the show. She's a therapist, alpha counseling and treatment. We are going to have a discussion about working with female sex offenders. So tune in for that one. Uh, also, make sure you go on to uh, Facebook, MySpace. Yeah, right. Who the hell has a MySpace anymore? I don't even know why I said that. We're not on there. You can go check it out if you want, but we're, we're definitely not on there. Uh, Instagram, oh, whatever it is. Find us on there. Questions, comments, rude remarks, whatever you got. And then please spread the word, share with your friends, and we will see you on episode 12.